morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Today is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. And today in our readings, we're going to hear about a rich man who comes to Jesus to ask what he should do to inherit eternal life. He comes from the Gospel of Mark, who alone is the one saying that Jesus looked on him and loved him. And out of love, not as judgment, Jesus offers him an open door to life. He tells them to sell all that he owns and to give it to the poor. Let us stand as we say together the confession and forgiveness found on page one of the bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is essence. Let us confess our sins to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. God, our comforter, like all of you, we have not been afraid. He is not one who should be scared. He turned our faces away from the justice and oppression. He is slow to earth, but happy and free. Forgive us of our sins. This is when we call out to you for help. We will see the glory of the Lord and the love of our Redeemer and Savior of our souls. Amen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes us righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also Therefore, because you trample on the poor, take from them 
that makes them great. You'll build houses on huge stones, but you shall not build them. You'll plant with pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions, and how great are your sins. You who afflict the righteous, you take a bribe, you push aside the needy and the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent at such a time. For it is an evil time. It seems good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord and God of hosts will be with you, just as you have said. Hate evil and love good, and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord the God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of the person. It's the word of God. Thank you, God. And you will have treasure in heaven. 
Then, come, follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astonished and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake, and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, O Christ. May be seated. Every time I hear this gospel, I remember about the time when I needed to move three times in five years. I know all of you kind of go like this. That's how I felt. I got to the place where I wouldn't unpack my boxes, but I had them very carefully labeled so that if I ever needed anything, I could go to a particular box and take out what I needed for that moment and then restore it to the box afterwards. Jesus spoke more about wealth in the New Testament than any other time. So what is Jesus saying to us today? This man, we're told, has great wealth. And he comes to Jesus and asks what he must do to inherit eternal life. When we hear that word inherit, we think about receiving something from someone. We learn in the story that this man evidently was a very devout religious man. He probably was one of those individuals who regularly went to worship, attended worship, gave his offerings at the temple, and maybe even did some good works in the community as well. But appears to us as if he thinks he can buy eternal life, that there's something that he himself can do in order to earn it. Jesus' words seem so very confrontational. They frightened the man. He became very distressed. Jesus said to him, sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Well, I don't believe that Jesus wants any of us to fall into poverty and expects all of us to attend to our own financial needs. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. It appears that the man is somehow held hostage by his belongings. That somehow he feels that his wealth is able to gain for him privilege, position, even with God. And so he comes to Jesus on this particular day and asks, What must I do to inherit eternal life? It's interesting that last Sunday the topic was on divorce. And as we talked about that during Mass last week, we came to realize that what Jesus was talking about was not merely divorce of a marriage, although he brought that into what he said, but it had more to do with those things that separate us from God and others. You've heard the old adage, someone being labeled as a workaholic, that somebody who is working so much away from the home that they basically don't have family life any longer. They don't even have an opportunity to socialize with friends or do anything other than work, work, work. In a way, that's a divorce. It separates the individual from those that he loves 
or she. It may even create an environment where the individual isn't even able to or doesn't connect with the religious community. When this young man came to Jesus in our story today, it appears as if he thought that Jesus could give him some magical formula that would enable him to inherit eternal life, a sure thing, kind of a prescription gospel, where Jesus would say, you do step one, two, and three, and you're in for sure. Jesus has a way of always shaking us up by what he says, and he does it to the young man today, telling the young man, you need to sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Well, I like the second part of that, giving it to the poor, because certainly in and through the church and in and through our personal lives, we do want to help people who are less privileged than we are, people who may be down on their luck or, or perhaps unemployed, maybe struggling with illness, but Jesus tells us regularly that we are to help others. And that's what our life in the church is all about, that we do this. But all that he has, all that he has, Jesus? You know, Jesus invites us into relationship with God where we give all of ourselves over to God. As God has given God's self over to us from the cross and the open tomb. This time of the year is often our stewardship emphasis, and we'll be starting that at Grace next month, very pointedly on Sunday Masses, talking about God's generosity and what our life in the church is all about as we share resources together. Seems to me in the story, Jesus is trying to redirect this young man away from his usual habits and his usual value system. He's telling the young man, you need to be different. You need to be doing something in a different way. You don't need to strive to try to figure out how to inherit eternal life because God has already done that for you. Now this is before this story actually takes place before Jesus' crucifixion. But he's on the road, on the way to Jerusalem at the time of the story. And we now know the ending of that story, which is the cross and the open tomb. So on this particular day, Jesus is trying to redirect the young man to realize that eternal life is a gift given to us by God through faith. Nothing we can do can earn it. But at the same time, God sets in front of us a mission and ministry to engage in where we can make visible in the world God's love and grace and generosity and care. That's what he wanted this young man to learn. Not to be so wrapped up in membership at the country club or going out on the yacht on the weekend. But think about others, the needs of others. And celebrate that gift that God has given us already from the cross and the open tomb. We learn in the story that the man goes away distressed. My hope for him is that he had an opportunity to think about and reflect upon what Jesus had said to him that day. That maybe at some point in time in his life he came to realize that we don't have to work hard to gain favor with God. The only work that God sets in front of us, meaningful work, is the work that we engage in in and through the church. As we strive together to grow in faith, to gather around God's word and sacrament, as we celebrate and remember the giftedness of God, the generosity of God from the cross, We learn in our story that the disciples also are in the process of understanding what Jesus is saying. And they ask him more about it. And again, in our reading, we have this image of a child. We had that last week. We've had it for about four or five weeks now. 
where God invites us into a relationship with God, where we make the approach as a little child would, with trust and hope in the risen Lord. God is a generous God. God is a generous God from the cross and the open tomb. That is what we recall and celebrate every Sunday. That is what the young man needed to learn. That's what the disciples needed to learn. And that's what we continue to learn and grow into in our life in and through the church. Today, Jesus comes to us and reminds us that the mission of the church is to give to the poor, to care for one another, to study and grow around God's word, that where Christ is the center of all we do and say. In a different story, Jesus gives an example of himself and his ministry, and then turns to his disciples and says to them, go and do likewise. Amen.
abundance to cause streams to break forth in the desert and manna to rain from the heaven. Accept the gifts you have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our lives to nourish the world you love so dearly. Through Jesus, who is the Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Stand. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's it's right right to our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God. Through our Savior Jesus, who is the Christ, who on this day overcame death and grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in our communion. Amen.
As we commune today, please wait until the person in front of you has already received the wafer before you begin coming forward. And please continue to mask until you've stepped away from the pastor.
his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Yeah. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. May the Holy Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Are there any announcements today? Then, If you weren't here last week, we got a gift from Kay Rosine and her congregation in Montana. There's a box of little prayer squares on the back table where you got your bulletin. There's a card there with a lovely note from Kay. So please read that and take a prayer square if you didn't get one last week. Thank you. Any other announcements? Two weeks from today, we begin our anniversary celebration. October 24th, a former pastor from Grace will be our guest preacher, Mandy Doerr. Hope you can all come and attend. I know he's looking forward to having an opportunity to talk to you with you also. He's very excited about it. We're actually going to have a baptism the day before, on Saturday the 23rd, which reminds me, for those of you who attended the baptismal font, if you might make sure that it's water, in the font for the 23rd baptism, um, it's to take place at noon on Saturday, so we'll also need to, I guess, to notify the cleaner to make sure that he's aware of this time frame. But on the 24th, that Sunday, um, Pastor Dora will be with us to deliver the message. And then on the 31st, not every year we have Reformation actually on the date, uh, because it'll be Reformation Sunday on the uh, 31st, but it's also Reformation Day. Um, we also will have a celebratory service then. And I believe that's the actual date of the anniversary. Exciting time in the life of, of grace. 90 years. I didn't quite feel that old. <laughs> but I'm getting there. <laughs> Don't tell it. Uh, this Thursday, we'll continue our Bible study. We actually ended up canceling last week just as a matter of circumstance. So uh, I'm hoping to get to Mark 11, 1 through 12, 12. But uh, I made the covenant promise that we would actually do last week's this coming week. So we'll see how far we get along with that because we have last week's bulletin with you. I generally send out the announcement about the day before to give you a chance to, to look at it before the actual day. Any other announcements? Well, we welcome our guests today. It's great to see you and to have you with us. Um, how was worship for you today, being with us? You all seem to fit right in. By the way, that's great. You're welcome to join us anytime. No complaints? No comments? No concerns? That's always a good thing. That's great. Let us stand together and sing our sending hymn, God, who is giving no, no end.
Thanks be to God.